All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show. We are your hosts, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. And we have a very special guest on today because um, we haven't talked about this yet, Eddie, but this is uh, something that drew me to the business back in the 80s. And it was back when I first started to think about uh, real estate investing was, you know, when I was young, I had no money. And uh, well, even when I was older, I didn't have any money. So, so <laughs> yeah. there, there, and I had to realize there was ways to get deals done that were not traditional. And people get so confused about, you know, you can buy money with, you know, you can buy a house with no money down. They don't understand all that. And I remember the, the early books from the um, Robert Allen, nothing down in the 80s, up now in the 90s, right? Remember all those books. And so now we get the privilege to be with, with this gentleman today who's brilliant at this. So Mr. Eddie Speed, we're glad to have you here from Dallas, Texas today. Welcome aboard. And I'm super Thank excited you. to be talking to a fellow Texan and he's right from my, my neck of the woods too, the Dallas Fort Worth area. I might as well just leave the podcast now. I might as well just leave, let you two talk. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. Well, welcome Eddie, we're glad to have you here today. Thank you. You specialize in um, buying on terms and you run the note school. All right, and that's that's your that's what you do, and so I this is going to be really great for our listeners today. To talk about creative financing and all that kind of stuff. So, I'm going to shut up. Tell us about you. Tell us what you do and how you get into this. Well, I started in the '80s. Also, uh, I started in 1980. Uh, my father-in-law and a partner were sort of pretty much the pioneers of buying seller finance notes. So I got in the business in the first probably you know, 10 years of the business, I predominantly dealt with just mom and pop that owned a note, right? They had owner financed a property. Then uh, in the late 80s, I met a guy, uh, he and his brother owned a real estate investing company in Dallas called Rainbow Realty. Their name, their last name was D'Angelo. And so John and Ken D'Angelo, John D'Angelo was still doing it today along with uh, the other brother, Paul, was younger brother, and Ken went off and formed a franchise for buying houses, which became very well known, called Homebusters, right? Wow, okay. Yeah. And uh, so I was their note guy. I was their note guy and a thousand other real estate investors' note guy. So I basically kind of, I set a mark that had really never been done in the business, which was really to give people a recipe of how to create seller financing. Yeah. Now, I, was, I didn't have note school back then. I was just making a living buying notes. So, so Eddie, can you, can you explain to the, the listeners what a note is? Because some of the listeners, listeners may not even know what that is. Yeah. yeah. So seller financing is where the seller of the property also carries long-term financing, right? So they become the bank. Now, yeah. all of us have signed a note because if you've ever written a check, you've written a note. But we've also, most all of us have signed installment notes to buy a car, to buy a house. You sign a note. It's a promise to pay. It's how you're going to pay them back. And so then the guy that is receiving payments on the note, essentially the bank or a seller financer, he's he didn't own the house anymore. He owns a, a note secured by real estate and he's collecting payments over time. So seller financers like wanted to sell property and offer financing. They just didn't know how to do it. They didn't know how they didn't know how to vet. You know, we, we've we've heard so much about hobbyist landlords and how they don't know how to vet tenants, right? Yeah. Well, it's hobbyist real estate investors trying to create seller financing. Even guys that did it over and over and over. I bought now 40 years in the business. I bought a thousand portfolios of seller finance notes. So I've seen the good way, and I've looked at probably 4,000, 5,000 portfolios I didn't buy, which means I've seen the bad way. Right. And you say well, buy, just, just for our listeners, Eddie, you you would buy, you're buying the paper. So somebody is somebody says, hey, you know, Mr. Seller, we're going to buy your house. We're going to pay you, let's just say, 500 bucks a month, for argument's sake, on a, on a long-term note. And you go in, that's what you did for a long time, maybe you still do. You go in and say to Mr. Seller, hey, I know you're getting 500 bucks a month for that. How about I pay you a lump sum and I take over those payments? Now, you're paying a discount, of course, for a profit for you, but they get their cash up front and then you get to have, then you collect the payments. So you're getting a good return on your money. Am I that's correct it. for saying that? That's it. I bought, I bought the note where they were collecting payments and now I bought the legal right to collect the payments. I bought over 50,000 notes. You became wow. the bank. Wow. I became okay, the great. bank. And so, but I, but my hand in glove relationship with real estate investors has always been critical to the volume, 
Like that's a lot of volume in the seller finance space. There wouldn't be anybody in the space that could probably come close to that number. That's right? a lot, yeah. But the reason I did that is because I controlled my market, right? I helped my market go create saleable paper so that they could sell me the loans. So anyway, long story short, I've done this in various ways over the years. Yes, we still have a note buying business, but, I, but I'm also active in real estate investing in a, a number of ways, usually somewhere around creative financing. So we're in a mutual mastermind. Yeah. I've been in that mastermind a long time. I've trained for, there's probably four gigantic, high volume real estate investor masterminds around the country, probably about four of them, right? Mm -hmm. I think the one that we're in is probably the most elite as far as the, the clientele that's in it, but there's about four of them that are what I call the ninja real estate investors. Mm -hmm. I've trained, I'm in this one, and then the other four, two of the, three of those four, I train also in those as well. Okay. So I, I get to train and see a lot of high volume real estate investors. They're brilliant at what they do. Let me just say that they're truly brilliant. They're not brilliant at creative financing. Yeah. Yeah. You said uh, something before we even just got started here that I think really intrigued me. You know, um, I don't even know if you know this, but we, we have a flipping company. That we'll do over 100, 110 deals this year. Do a lot of wholesale, a lot of flips. We've done over 600 flips ourselves. You know, we're, we're actively in the market and doing it. Um, and we've been doing a lot more creative financing this past year, just from my, one of our couple of our early deals were, were some creative financing that we yeah. put together. And I've always been fascinated by that. And yeah. you said something before we, before we started recording that I want to make sure we touch on today. I thought I wrote it down. Actually, you said that, um, you teach people how to, to write deals on the deals that are garbage for other investors. And yeah. I can't tell you how much garbage, you know, garbage that's not actually garbage that over the years we've probably thrown out because of our sales teams and not having the knowledge and the skills to convert. And we all know it's all about conversion. Yeah, because they, mm. you just end up cherry picking the ones that are easy to do right. where there's really gold in a lot of that garbage though, if you can just like spend a little more time and get creative with it. Yeah. What I figured out was this, I started training a lot of these high volume guys, right? I, I would say, 300 of the top 500 guy, you know, house buyers, house flippers in the business have been to note school in the last two years, right? Now they've not all personally coached with me or whatever, but they've been to, they've been through a, a regiment of training. This is the pattern they told me over and over and over. Now you got to remember, I am a specialist. I'm not brilliant, but I'm seasoned, yeah. right? And I've been seasoning at this business for 40 years. So what I've learned, you mentioned, you know, the old in the 80s guys that wrote the books and stuff. They actually copied most of that stuff sure. from, a, from a guy named Jack Miller. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I knew Jack very well. And I have had a lot of old Jack Miller people come through my lineage. Okay. Yeah. And he was really good at starting these ideas. But understand... <clears throat> I have taken what he did and I've like drilled it 10 miles deep, right? And and so I've made this especially, I like it. I kind of wake up thinking about this every day. And now I coach a lot of, lot of guys to do this. And so we cut up like literally a dozen to 25 deals a week. And, the, and so we try to craft how we make an offer to the story, not not take the same offer, the same structure and lay it over the top of every deal, which is what I found that most people were doing, yeah. right? And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's not brain surgery, but it's a different mind of thinking because I go into your, your, your crew, right? The guy, you, you, if you're buying a hundred houses, you got a crew, right? Oh, you, yeah. oh yeah, 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 of course. I, yeah. I fully understand. <laughs> but here's the problem. You look at it and you say, you come to, you guys come to a class. I'm fairly sure you come to a class, you'd leave there like, oh God, that's some pretty creative stuff, right? I mean, yeah. that's the normal response. Sure. Right. And then the next question is, oh my God, Eddie, how would we ever implement this? I could never teach my acquisition team all this stuff. Right. Truth of the matter is you're exactly right. So in frustration about a year ago, you know, I'm a year into this. It's cool. You know, I'm a training guy, but who wouldn't love to go train the best in the business, right? So I train the regular beginners, just like everybody else. 
but I've got a lane in note school that's like for what I call the ninjas, right? Okay. And it's cool. I mean, that's really fun to get to do that. But the truth of the matter is, in real life, what they said is we have a real hard time fitting this model into our business because the the, the entrepreneur, the guy that is in CG or some other board or some other mastermind, yeah. the, the owner of the business goes, that's really cool. I understand it. I'd love to do it, but I don't have time to really apply this every day. And the truth of the matter is, I don't believe I can teach my sales team to go do this. Right. And so then I came up with an idea. I actually came up. I, I, I really won't even say I came up with the idea. I, a guy that really has revolutionized the wholesaling business came up with the idea named John Martinez. OK, so John believes in what we do. And I'm I'm venting with John because John John realizes that we people are certainly leaving deals in the trash can that could be closed. Like, well, how do you fix this? Right. Mm -hmm. And so. So John says, well, just have them do an option agreement, tie it up in an option agreement, and then transfer it to one of your specially trained folks. Oh. So then so I started everybody. to train everybody. You just have to have a specialist. Because exactly. you're taking a very like original approach to all of these deals. They're, it's not like a template or a mathematical equation where you can just like look at the comps and figure out how much renovation is needed and all that. You're taking a really original, creative approach to each deal. So you have to get somebody that thinks like that too. Here's what I figured out. When I when I started down this road, there was a guy that actually runs one of the other masterminds that knows me well. Uh, his family is in the uh, turnkey business. They've done, you know, like 8,000 turnkey houses in Memphis, right? Oh yeah, I know those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, he he called he we, we he pulled me aside and he says, Eddie, that is. That stuff is amazing. He said, I completely see how you could do literally double your conversion rate. He said, every real estate investor needs to know this. I said, I yeah. know that. And yeah. he said, well, why don't you go build training? And I, cause I, we're referring to the guys in these masterminds. I said, I don't, it's what, it's what's on your website, right? I, I said, I don't know that they're trainable. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I don't need the Joe Cools to show up. Right. right. I don't think Joe Cool is not trainable to show up. I've been doing this 40 years. I'm too grumpy to deal with them. The Joe, the Joe Cool is. <laughs> your, your ego at the door. I love that. That's a good point. Yeah. The Joe Cool is. Yeah. What are you going to teach yeah. me? I know everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I so I committed to him. He committed to go send me some very high volume guys. What, by the way, that have really done well with it. Right. So he so we in that process because I realized I called about. I didn't call you, Glenn, but I probably called 20 guys that were fairly well known to make terms offers. Mm -hmm. Okay, five conversations into it. You know what I hung up the phone and figured out? They all said one thing. Here's how we make our terms offer. And the next ah, one, thing, one way, right? Exactly. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. that don't sound very creative to me. Right. right. Okay. So what I realized was, is there was that, that while they were doing things and they had good success stories, I'm not saying they weren't success stories, but they weren't playing NFL football. Mm -hmm. They were playing junior high football or varsity football, but they weren't playing NFL level. Yeah. And so I realized there was, there was so much room in the market. Now, let me just tell you this. When I started this journey, I believe that I've looked at between three and 400,000 seller finance notes. Nobody wow. in the industry could say that, right? Wow. Literally, nobody could say that. This is all I've done. I've studied it. I've made a science out of it. I like it. I'm clearly, I hope you see, I'm passionate about it. And beyond all that, what, what humbled me was six months later, how much I realized I had learned. Yeah. And then six months later, how much I realized I had learned. In other words, I just hadn't taken my mind there. Not really taken my mind there. Interesting. And so what I started really realizing was this is a this the, to make this successful, it's a combination. When you're going to get somebody to carry creative financing for you, the talk off is is critical. Now, if you don't know where you're going with the structure, the talk off is not going to make sense. So mm -hmm. let me give you one simple example of that. Yes. Everybody always see, I know statistically that seller financing a third of the time they pay like zero to 5,000 down. Statistically, mom and pops that seller finance a third of the time 
they don't carry anything down and they almost never ask for any credit underwriting. They almost yeah. never ask for any information. So me personally guaranteeing a loan or even corporately guaranteeing a loan, that would be worthless to them. Why would I do that? Right. Yeah. 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 So those are things that I just sort of know care. Like those are the characteristics of people that sell or finance. It's, it's the pattern that I've now studied after a lot of time. Right. But here's the question. How much down payment do they want? <clears throat> I've learned if you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answer. Yeah. Right. So yeah. instead of saying, if you, if, if, if you sell or finance me, how much down payment would you want? Or saying, this is how much down payment I'm willing to pay. Here's a better question, Glenn. What are your immediate cash needs? Mm. Much better way to ask. And it's because such an important they, point, too, because it because is. Because if they say they want 20% down, it's no problem, Glenn. I'll go get a 20% private first mortgage and have them subordinate to a second. Right. You see what right. I'm saying? Now I paid yeah. nothing down, but they got their 20%. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of one of like 100 different things that I've kind of learned about this and studied. Yeah. So that, so that we'll understand now, now I'm helping somebody at the kitchen table accomplish it. I, you, you know, I already know what they want. They want retail, they want all their money up front and they want to close in 24 hours, right? That's, that's sure. they all want that. Yeah, but guess what? Course. It ain't gonna happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we yeah. gotta prioritize what's real and what's, what's not gonna be real for them. Why, why would they carry terms? The answer is, this is why it matters to your audience. They carry terms because I can erase the discounted price. Now I'm getting it at an advantage because I'm not paying cash today. I'm paying for it with tomorrow's dollars. So naturally I can pay more money if I'm not paying for it all today. But in their mind, that's why they agreed to it. So yeah, so it's one of the things we we deal with all the time, right? As real estate investors, is people, especially new people, they're, you're always we're always uncomfortable with that first offer and discussing the you're discussing the the number, right? Well, I want I want a hundred thousand dollars. Well, good, my offer is twenty five. You know, it's that it's that awkwardness of that first thing. But you're saying that when you do owner financing, if that if that becomes an option you can work with seller financing, that you can you know not discuss that so bluntly. There's a, there's a couple of ways, and I think you can implement this with your sales team easy enough. And then they still can make a commission out of it. Maybe they don't get quite as much. Or you're you're an innovative guy. You can figure out what that looks like. <laughs> The idea is, is there's two ways you can sell your property. I can come closer to meeting your price expectations if you take your equity over time. Right. If you need all of your, if you need all of the price today, you're not going to get as much for your equity. Yeah. And it helps you in even counterbalancing the cash offer. Well, I don't yeah. want to take my money over time. Okay. Well, then once again, we can focus on the cash price. You may have such a value for getting the money today, but Glenn, think about it. Isn't it, isn't it true that half of the people that you end up talking to have a money problem and half of the people have a real estate problem? True, yes. So, so understand that your money problem solution is paying cash today at a discount. Yes. But your real estate problem solution is not really solving the problem that they have it solves a problem but it's not their problem yeah they think they want the money now but there might be there might be a lot of turn a lot of cases that they're willing to to work with people and do me a favor i want to step back because we have a lot of folks listen to us that are brand new or kind of even just thinking about getting in and so i think it's important maybe to give an example give an example of a seller finance deal you know, we've done we've done lots of them over the years and and i'm anxious to, to learn more from you actually so i'm looking forward to that because i yeah i haven't done three or four hundred thousand i haven't looked at that many so <laughs> i don't know maybe a couple hundred but not 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 that many that's a very impressive number but maybe what's a simple one that people can kind of wrap their head around to understand what a seller finance deal looks like that'd be somebody good for our wanting to like get started in it yeah, yeah. somebody so, so somebody says i don't have the best credit i don't have the whatever but i've got somebody and maybe they're willing to take terms over this. And how do I get paid? How, how does that work? What's that look like? If you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot. So here's a case study. Here's a here's a specific case study I like to use in a class. This young yeah. man, his name is Scott Bowers. He lives in Phoenix. Okay. 
Yep. So he's a he's a ninja guy, you know, does a lot of business and stuff. And, and he's the young, hot shot real estate investor. And and really, but I like Scott because he kind of thinks like an old man. Because the guys that always talk about how much volume they do buying houses, I want to know how much money they're making. And it right. bothers me they're not gaining wealth. As an older guy, it bothers me they're not thinking that way. Yeah. And it's so pretty I, common. <laughs> pretty common. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I feel like that's part of our influence, right? We're, we, we can influence and help people, you know, think a little differently. Yes. So he finds a guy that is willing to discount him a house and sell it. But he's an older guy and he doesn't really need the money. In fact, he's just going to pass it on to his heirs. And he said, well, wouldn't you rather pass along the right to receive monthly payments, you know, in something that's going to give them long term income versus just passing on a lump sum of cash. And now they got to go figure out what to do with it. You know, and they're not sophisticated investors, so they're going to put it in the stock market or they're going to go buy a rental and find out they don't like that. Mm -hmm. And so he did a good job of kind of taking this man through a vision this older gentleman took him through a vision of what that could look like so he buys a house and i can right this second i can't quite remember the numbers but it's something about yeah. like this he buys it for 200 he does agree to pay twenty thousand down right and and one thing that was interesting in it and i teach this a lot right like when you say an interest rate the customer hears a rate in their head right a lot of people always want to make, well, I'd buy my loans for nothing down or for no interest. They're just paying principal over time and stuff. That's the old structure, right, that a lot of these guys try. Well, the problem is most customers really actually won't go for that. So you're right. going to lose a lot of customers that wouldn't agree to that. What I have learned is that you can pay little or no interest up front and then escalate the rate on the backside of the note. Right. So you'd pay like 2% today and 4% or 5% like after 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now people say, well, why would you agree to that? Because if I get an artificially low rate, like zero, 1%, even 2%, and if I can do that up front, I am I am drastically accelerating the the amortization of how much money is owed. Right? The lower the rate, the more. I'm sawing off of the principal. Right. Got Meaning, it. Right. Yep. I'm paying what sounds like a higher rate, but on less principal. So you're so for our listeners, make sure they understand. So in banking, when you make you you get a loan, if we do a rental, we do a lot of rental refi. We have a big rental portfolio. We do a lot of refis. And so you're always paying heavy interest. Those first what, four, five, six years, whatever, you're heavy interest. And like if, if, if a payment is 500 bucks, you'd be lucky if 50 bucks a month is going towards your principal. Even though I have a great rate. Oh, I have a rate of 3.9%. That's the rates are great now. 3.8, whatever, three, whatever. That's wonderful. But it's all interest. It's stacked up. It's all interest up front, right? Yeah. So I've learned that there's some things like that that are just not complicated formulas, but they're just sort of strategies that I can do that get. So this this older gentleman carries this note like over a 30 year AM and a 15 year balloon. So he couldn't get into a straight 30 year AM, but he did get into a 15 year balloon. Now he, now so, so he borrowed, so just think in terms of, he buys his house for 200, he pays 20,000 down. So he owes 180. He resells the house, he doesn't sell it for excessively more money. So he maybe sells it for 220, right? So he bought it at a slight discount, but not a giant discount. But he resells it and gets 40,000 down. People go, how do you do that? Well, let me just tell you, according to Ellie May, the average down payment on a new purchase for a conventional mortgage last month was 19% down. That's just data, right? Most people, most real estate investors really don't actually know where the mortgage industry really is right now. It's in a turmoil. It's, yeah. it's in a box. 35% yeah, yeah. of the people that could get a mortgage in February can't get one today. Well, that's just now people that I can sell or finance. I mean, the pool of available people so that can be seller finance is excessively bigger than it was, right? So he finds this, what we call this penalty box buyer. He resells it. He writes in the paperwork up front that it's wrappable 
It's assumable. All these clauses that a bank wouldn't agree to, but an individual will, right? So I want to make sure we, we back up because you, you've got some, there's so many big <laughs> nuggets there that I understand, you understand, but I think it's really important for our listeners to understand because they're probably going, that sounds like a lot. He's got a really cool accent, but what the hell is he talking about? So I think that we got to wrap around and say, or I'm using the wraparound word, we got to go, go go backwards a little bit and say, if I if I boil this down, which is which is something that is so funny, you learn things and you forget about them, then you hear them again and go, huh, like why am I why am I not doing that? We we are not doing this. But what you're saying is, Eddie, you can go buy a house with seller financing. Correct me if I'm wrong. You buy a house with seller financing. There's creative terms to make that work, and every deal is a little bit unique, but you find a deal. So you're not buying at an incredible discount where you're buying you know 30 cents in the dollar. But you're buying 70, 80 cents in the dollar, maybe. Let's just say. Yeah. You then sell that house and you become the seller financing person, but you're getting a down payment that covers what you had to put in to get the deal done, maybe more, maybe less, but you're covering that and then you're getting the payments for it. I'm doing exactly what your bank does, right? We're we're paying this, he's paying this older gentleman. 2% interest and he's collecting 6% interest. Exactly. Right? He's taken he's taken 180,000 that he owes and now taking 180,000 that he's owed, he's paying 2% and he's collecting 6%. Plus, he he paid 20,000 down when he bought it, he immediately resold it and got 40,000 down. So there is his transactional income. He made twenty thousand a day because everybody says I can't live without that money, right? Oh yeah. And and then, but once again, now he has fifteen years of the delta between two percent and six percent, which is which is a lot of money. It's like six hundred bucks a month, yeah. right? And now all of a sudden, look at look at what he's really done, which is created wealth. Which is my heart is to show people how to dig a deal out of the trash can and make wealth out of it instead of you know, recycle the paper. And it's also a win-win for the buyer because the buyer can't get, th that buyer may or may not be able to get a loan from a bank. This older gentleman was not willing to take a super deep discount on his house. Right. Right. So, so, so this was a trash can deal. He, he, he couldn't flip it because the old fellow wasn't, nice, nice old fellow, right? But he wasn't willing to take that much of a discount. So then he asked these probing questions that led to, oh, you might, if, if I could pay you more money, you would be willing to carry your equity over time. That's what led him to that conversation. Yeah. Then he, now you could say, well, he could rent it and he could rent it. Um, That's a whole different argument. I, I, I get all my, that, right? <laughs> I don't want to get off into my whole economic forecast in this. I yeah. will say to you that I think most real estate investors are pretty oblivious as to how the mortgage industry thinks, what the mortgage industry thinks is going to happen and everything that they're doing in preparation for a real estate market that we haven't seen yet, mm -hmm. right? We, we are, we are, we're in a very interesting time where there is a shortage of listings and there's a fight to go buy real estate. And, you know, let's just sort of say, I think you guys probably agree with me. The fools are out, right? Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and, but the reality is, is there's a second thing to come. And I believe that we have now entered a note cycle market for two reasons, right? The mortgage industry the mortgage industry has really, really, really tightened their criteria. I know you hear in the news, there's more mortgage business than that, but 75% of that's refis, right? First of all, right. and secondly, yes. the mortgage credit availability, which is published every month by mortgage bankers, is 35% less than it was in February. So there's a gigantic shortage of people that could get a mortgage and now can't get a mortgage. And I believe they're the perfect candidate seller finance. That's a very interesting, it's, it's so, I told you when, when we opened this up today that I was reading those things back in the 80s. Now, I didn't actually, we, Amber and I started really getting serious about real estate uh, until 2007. We started back in the mouse when the market crashed. That's when we started. We were, not because we were brilliant, not because of anything. We just, that's what we, that's just what, that's when we needed to make money. 
so that's when we got together. That's when we started. So we we built through the very difficult times, and we had to find ways to navigate that. What you're offering people today is a way to navigate now and in the future to be prepared, because I believe now you have to correct me on this because I don't know if this is accurate. I feel like in the 80s when the when the interest rates were ridiculous and things were coming down, that there was a lot more opportunity for seller finance in the 80s, early 90s. And then that kind of has that kind of has gone a little little wayside maybe in the in the education of the of the masses and the public about that. But on a side note, yeah, we're going to talk to you with our team because I mean I I can't and so I think you summarize on a, on a high level conversation here just for a second. People can hear this. It's I never like I thought to myself I have a bazillion ideas in my head, right? I'm just I'm an idea man, right? That's what my that's my job. I'm a visionary of my company. I'm an idea man, but trying to implement that. Even the thought of it exhausts me. But but what you when you said have a person or a team that that's what they do, all of a sudden massive light bulb in my head, Eddie. Like I was like, oh, that's suddenly doable. Like all of a sudden that's, that's doable. And so bring it back down to people that are brand new. Even just having two or three of your possible scenarios or education in their head in their arsenal. So they can close a deal. I mean, game changer. And it's and it's one more exit strategy. So any even anybody that has a company like this, it's just one more exit strategy, one more place that you know whether whether we have a lead comes in. You know, we we pay a lot of money for our leads. So oh, yeah. so we have a lead that comes in that might be a good flip. It might be a good um, vacation rental. It might be a good wholesale. wholesale. It, it might not be any of those, and so we send it off to our brokerage as a traditional listing. This is one more avenue that we can use as an exit strategy for. Yeah, I, I can't think leads. of all the ones that are garbage. You know, I don't want to call them garbage leads, but just like what you garbage can leads, because because we say yeah, they're not garbage leads, garbage can. That's what you said. That's better. So mine didn't sound so good, but <laughs> but there are garbage leads too. But garbage can leads is that they just don't they don't they're not in a position where they have to take a big discount. They don't want to, and they don't need to. So if you can come to them and say. I'm willing to come close, but let's talk about this over time. And just that structure, that excites me today. This has been a really great call to me. So I, and I, yeah. I, I love it when you can create a win-win scenario for people too, so that everybody well, walks away happy, you know? And here's the thing about it. I, like in your educational business, I'm not competing with what you do. Right. I'm right. not, I'm not, I'm not teaching them the things about buying houses that you're teaching them. Yeah. I am, I am a specialist that bolts on to people's real estate business. Once again, you're not giving up any of the other ways you would do your business. You're right. just simply saying, what, it, the, my, what is the saying that we all say in these big masterminds, right? Get the juice out of the lemon. Yeah. And you stop yeah. and you think about it. And this is the juice that's in the lemon. And once again, nobody saw, or generally nobody denies the opportunity of this or the possibility of this, right? I don't know any like high volume guys that develop, oh, that won't work, right? right. If they, yeah. That's a little bit, there may be amateurs that would say that, but no seasoned guys deny that that's possible. But then I had to figure out how to help them really apply it to their business. It's, it's just creative enough that people go like, oh man, I mean, like I can see that, but I, I Eddie, I, you're too big to get in my pocket. I can't take you with me, you know? And yeah, there were, yeah. so then all of a sudden I had to go. So then all of a sudden I attract a student that I can train to go do this, that they can spend time with me and whiteboard and do all of, it's, it's a process, right? Sure. But they can do that and then they can go become a specialist with real estate investors. So we're, in other words, they don't have to have the rat race of chasing all the leads. They can right. just have a, I call them a designated hitter. They uh -huh. come in, they come in and they, they, they're they a specialist to go dig through the trash can and help a real estate investor monetize the leads that he's essentially gonna throw away. Yeah, what a great, what a great thing. This has been, um... This has been an enlightening half an hour or 40, whatever it's been. This has been great. And it's true because that person honestly has a different mindset. Their their focus is on creating these kind of deals. And our the name of our podcast is the real estate of mind. So this this like ties in perfectly. Let me ask you, I, I want to, and as we wrap up, I want to make sure people know how to get a hold of you and find you. It's really, really going to be important. And um, we are real estate of mind shows all about, we, we believe strongly that if you don't have it right in your head that you can't deal with this like you just won't be successful if you don't have it right you've been 40 years in the game my friend so i wanted to, what 
what can you what what do you do to keep your mind right what have you done over the years because you've certainly been through good times bad times a bazillion different presidents a bazillion different parties leading all the stuff where you know as this is recording we don't know what's going to happen in the world right it's just crazy right now experience he has experience his experience like, for yeah. sure but i want to know how you how you've kept your mind right all these years i'm assuming it is right so I <laughs> well, it, it's probably not, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We're all a little off, I think, Eddie. Yeah. At this level, we're all a little off. So you know, it, it's a great question. I, I do find I definitely find myself that that we are entrepreneurs first, and then we are implementing a business second, yeah. right? And and I, I I will tell you this: an entrepreneur is the one that positions themselves mentally to overcome the objections that are obviously going to be in the road in front of them, right? It, the objections are going to happen. At the moment, to be perfectly honest with you, I think most real estate investors, as a majority, as a class, uh, you know, if I lumped everybody with a business card and said they're a real estate investor, I think a high percentage of them are very, are very unaware of industry stats. I don't think they I don't think they know where what's out there. I think they're I don't think they're reading a roadmap that goes very far out. Right. I th so I'm very focused right now on understanding where the market is, understanding what what where, where real estate investors are, where realtors are, where mortgage banking is, the shadow inventory that I believe is excessive that has not been affected by the market yet. Yeah, yeah. And and so there's a lot of things that I think so those are things for me like those are action items that I do, but first it becomes mental. Right? I can't go give people good advice in the business if I don't think I can look over the horizon a little bit and say, here's where the market is, here's where the ball's going and here's what I think we could do about it. Right? And I think to every degree, I don't expect somebody to, it, it's hard to give somebody my 40 years experience, right? That would be difficult. I, I'm not near as good a house buyer as you. I'm certain of that. I believe that I, I'm the top of the game on creative financing, right? Sure. So that, that's where you're looking at a real estate investor. You're going, Eddie, now, now I can rely on, on all of those years that you spent kind of specializing in this and help me apply it to my business. Well, see, they're seeing you, and you said that on the call, right? So, so they, they're seeing you now applying that entrepreneurial idea. Sure. Right? And that's that's really what I think is the most important thing is obviously this entrepreneur thing is a head game, yeah. right? And and, yeah, it's all head. <laughs> and when you don't know where you're going, you're lost. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Sure. It's all it's all head and all heart. It's yeah. all it's it, we're all in all that. So and yeah, it, it, it's true though because we get so busy and we get so busy working in the business that we forget to work on it, and then we get like you know in the weeds and all the details and all that. Sometimes it's hard to see around the corner where the headlights are pointing, but it's it's a really really important part. You yeah. know, at at our um, networking group that we're yeah part of. In all of the table discussions and lunch, when we sit down and have lunch with people and all of that, I think I hear Eddie Speed's name more than any other name in the group collectively. That's been very true. Because, you know, like everybody, we're talking about these deals and it's like, oh, we got to talk to Eddie Speed about that. We got to talk to Eddie Speed. Yeah, Eddie Speed needs to get on. You know, like, yeah. like I think I hear your name more than any other name <laughs> around. It was funny when I saw your name on the podcast, on the schedule, I said, oh. Been wanting to meet him. This is good. I've been wanting to meet Eddie. I keep hearing about Eddie Speed. It's a cool name. It so is. you got to go with the real name. And he's a Texan. He's be a race car driver. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it is. I'm. I, I like I said, I'm a specialist, and and um, you know, I think, um, you know, I I really in the even in the training business, I was sort of going in another direction. I didn't really have in mind training high volume real estate investors. I never yeah. entered entering these masterminds with that thought. And it just, you're, you're talking about an entrepreneur and stuff is I had to get a vision of, okay, do they need to know it? Yes. And the second real question was, can I actually teach them to do it? And can we figure out a, a, a relationship where it's worth it to them to go through the process of going through the education? Because God, you, as you well know, most guys at your level don't go by training, right? Right. That's right. not usually what they do, but, but was it something that made sense? 
And and once again, I you know I, I'll tell you one funny story about entrepreneurship for, and I know we probably need to stop. And I'm sorry that I, I just like okay, it. No, great, you're great. good. We're good. <laughs> so I about the first year I started training these high volume guys, I had some failures. Sure. I mean, like a ninja house buyer, 200, 300 houses a year. And I'm so excited, man. I mean, case studies excessively, blah, blah, blah. And I had some that really did great. And I had a few that didn't do great. And I was really frustrated by this. So there's a guy that I believe influenced me named Gary Harper, right? He does EOS for us so, and you guys. So and he's, he's running all of our companies right now. The yeah. past six, but continue on. But we're, I've been very close with Gary, but go ahead. So Gary knows me. Gary knew me from even before he started his EOS business, right? I mean, and so Gary and I, and so I was having a conversation with him about some specific clients of his that hasn't implemented this well. And so I'm trying to understand mechanically what is wrong. And he said, well, Eddie, you sold the visionary you didn't sell the implementer implementer <laughs> right so the visionary comes back to his company and says man this guy is good at the whiteboard like you can't believe him blah 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 it's just awesome and stuff and all of a sudden the the, the implementer goes oh my god when's he gonna forget about this he come up with a new idea that they don't know how to do to look at does this sound does this sound right that's great oh that's right so so, so for me, so I said, okay, Gary, how do I fix this? I said, I, I desperately care that they're successful. And I desperately, I know that the industry needs this. I truly know it needs it, but it can't, it can't utilize it if they can't implement it. And he is the one that helped me with the designated hitter idea. Okay. So John Martinez came up with the idea of putting it under an option agreement. Right. And then Gary Harper right behind there. So these are two well-known figures in the high volume space. Right. Yeah, sure. and then Gary says, Eddie, they need to hand the deal off to somebody that you can train. Yeah. So that it doesn't take, you know, in Glenn's company, it doesn't take 12 people that can do this. Right. 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 Now, I don't mean that you guys as business owners won't have some comprehension of it or some level of understanding. But it even means that you wouldn't necessarily have to be the ultimate expert. Yep. And so when I finally, so so understand here I am with a business idea. I'm like fired up, right? I'm, I've dealt with hundreds of high volume real estate investors with creative financing, right? I mean, I've had excessive experience doing this. And I'm like, I know everybody needs to do it. Like, so in my heart, I know it's a good product. I know it's something they should add. But the but then I reach down into the grind of actually implementing it within within a business. So we're talking about how do you how do you stay an entrepreneur and how do you overcome objections and how do you mentally get through it and stuff. So for me, I mean, I'm struggling with this, and this has been like a year ago. Okay. So I'm struggling with it, but I'm what I'm doing is, is I'm going to somebody that had a global view, like Gary Harper clearly has a global view. He implements entrepreneurial operating system techniques for 400 high volume real estate investors and a few guys like me. Yeah. Okay. Which for them to implement, it, it's just helping you run your business better, help you implement oh, EOS, right? It's been a game changer for us. Yes. So, so the answer is he understood. So I needed advice from him on how to, for people to practically apply this to their business. Now, what I didn't think of up front, which is very interesting, is now all of a sudden I can take kind of a newbie or kind of a not a high volume guy and I can make him a specialist, mm -hmm. right? I'm showing him how to go do it. And I already know the audience, right? I already know who he can go call on. I've already got customers that need that problem solved. I just need to go train a soldier to go solve the problem. And I didn't, that was not in my mind. That wasn't like, I, I wasn't like mentally thinking up front to do it. So it's a little bit of like this journey that we find ourselves on as an entrepreneur all the time. Yeah. You know, we end up somewhere that's not where we started. 
And I know you guys have been excessively successful at guiding your business based on what, you know, what the trail, reading the trail every day and what it led you to. Well, yeah, so feel so successful some days and some days not so much. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, some days you're like, I got this shit dialed in. The next day you're like, my God, I'm going to kill myself. What am I doing? So. Well, and I was thinking too, it's like um, you mentioned, you know, people that are successful, you know, they're not really into the coaching, but I think Glenn and I were like, one of the things we talk about a lot of times is, all right, the older we are, the dumber we know, we realize we were. So like, we're, right. we're all about the education and learning and implementing. And one thing that we've really um, done a lot better over the last few years is becoming more owners of our business instead of operators. And so if we can, you know, have the right people in place, you know, j just like Gary says, right butts, right seats. So if we can get those right people and the specialists trained to know those exit strategies, you know, like we're all about that because we don't want to be in the weeds. We want to just like, you know, have that 10,000 foot view and, and be able to, so if we can teach people how to kind of like skip that section by building your business the right the first time, because we all do this for freedom. That's what entrepreneurship is about, is freedom. You know, when I come up with my best again. ideas, you know, when <laughs> I come up with my best ideas, I come up with my best ideas when I'm off. Yeah. And right. then when I come back, right, I always try to reschedule time when I come back from vacation or, you know, just a long weekend or whatever, right? I try to schedule time to stop and I know some idea is going to land. I just know it. I've experienced it enough now to know that. So when I'm, when I'm not so busy is when the clarity comes when I'm so, as you said, and when I'm, when I'm like fighting every day just to survive and, yeah. and we all end up in do businesses and do that. Right. We, we try to tell our students that never happens to us, but it does. It does. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, 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 but, but the truth of the matter is, is, is when I am clear is when these creative ideas come. Now, fortunately for me right now, I'm paid excessively the most when I'm creative. Yeah. Right. So I try to I try to surround myself with people that, as you if you guys have said, operationally, I'm not deeply involved. I'm not back there flipping loan files every day. I have staff that does it. It's just not me. Yeah. Right. And it allows me to do it because really when I'm helping these students with creative ideas and you're saying, well, if you're helping an existing student, well, then you're fulfilling note school. Well, it, you know what it's also doing? Just think about how many case studies that I figured out from when I kind of started specializing in this two years ago or added this as a specialization, I should say, and how many different case studies that I really had never really thought about that now I've become clear about. You see what I'm saying? So those yeah. creative thoughts translate not just to the existing student, but they translate to a student that I hadn't even met yet. Yeah. This has been I we I could probably talk to you for about a day and a half straight. We could probably yeah I can see our brain my you got this went from an interview to learn about creative financing to really rethinking our business. I, I'm already sitting here you know so I am the entrepreneur right. I'm already the shiny object guy that look you know but I I can I have a meeting right now with my implementer. I'm he's probably gonna go oh god okay what is it but what now I know I haven't figured you got I to be the Betty Speed guy. I haven't got the last vision you got started. Will you just give me a break? But. We already do a lot of this stuff now, but listen, tell, tell, tell our listeners how they can reach you. How can they find you? How can they listen? How can they know what you do? Tell them how they can find you. Okay, so I realized when, I, when we start these conversations, I know where it's gonna go. And the next step is somebody says, this sounds really cool, but I need a little more clarity. So I, yeah. I'm gonna give them two things I think are really gonna help them. We yeah. have written a book that has been substantially modified since the virus. So it's a post-COVID written book about creative financing. Okay. Right? Okay. So we call it, it's real estate for Moneyball. Uh, uh, Moneyball for real estate, right? Oh, we, so love, we, love that movie, by the way. Moneyball yeah. for real estate. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, it's an it's it, the idea, and so it's about five chapters, about fifty pages, but it's pretty solid. It gives about five different structures, so people start seeing different ways and how that might apply. Okay. The second thing is is that we're going to put your listeners in a little workshop where we can have some time and slow it down with them and actually work through some of these concept case studies and stuff. It's hard to give somebody a case study just like this because yeah. you kind of need the whiteboard to do it. Yeah. And so those are things that, that I think are good action steps to do. 
Um, and it's simple. You just go to noteschool.com forward slash get started. Easy enough. Noteschool.com forward slash get started. And so there's a little landing page. You'll fill out just a minimal number amount of information and then you'll get the ebook and read that right seriously i'm 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 yeah. saying if this sounds like something to do this is a short read it's not a giant commitment but it will start these wheels in your heads turning and then by the time you get to the little workshop the workshop's going to be more meaningful and make more sense yeah. you get more out of it at our at our home they're, they're, flipping workshop they're building blocks yeah at, at our home flipping workshop the i open up friday morning or it's a three day workshop and Friday morning, I spend the first the first half of the morning really on mindset. And I start by saying, everything in our life begins with a thought. And I, I look around and with the color of the thread that holds the, everything that we have is a thought. So like you're saying, if you get the, you, the only way you start to get good at this stuff, and as you get older, I think you start to look back and realize this. The only way you get good at something is to start thinking about it. It's that initial like, well, I wonder if that's for me. Well, maybe it is. Well, if it is, then what's this and what's that? And that little thought just keeps going down that path. But and don't get so it's kind of the same thing I was saying before though and that that you agreed with you get so busy working in the business that you don't have time to work on it I would just encourage our listeners to don't be so busy you know not get so busy in your life that you forget to work on it as well because the day you know days pass and go on and you get on that hamster wheel and you do the same thing over and over and over lather rinse repeat you forget well here, here here's the thing about it we all understand we've all been told don't just work hard, work smart. We've all been told this, okay? What I believe is this is a practical application of how you can work smart. Yeah, very true. Right. And you can, and you can, it's a, it's a way, yeah, it takes that and takes it to the next level and gives you an actual roadmap, it sounds like, to, to be able to work smart. So I can tell you, we're, Eddie, this has been, this has been awesome today. I, uh, I know that we're going to be reaching out after this. We're going to connect, I'm sure, and be talking about our team because I've already, I, my next meeting is with my implementer. So I'm actually uh, excited about that. And now I know why everybody talks about the great Eddie Speed. Now I finally have it. Now I got it all figured out. So cool. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. It was awesome stuff. And uh, please, we're going to, I'm sure we'll come back and visit again and talk. So absolutely. thank you for being here. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you very much. All right, all our listeners, we'll uh, we'll see you again on the, on the next episode of the Real Estate of Mind Show with Glenn and Amber. And uh, thank you guys for being here today. We'll see you real soon. Mm -hmm.